Hello, and welcome back to the channel again. Apologies for the slow uploads, both mine and Nicholas's lives have been very busy at the moment. However, we're back with another video on the lives of the British Saints this time. I will simply be reading from the book Orthodox Saints of the British Isles Volume 4, which covers October to December. The book is wrote by Dr John Hutchison Hall, and I recommend that everybody goes to pick it up. Before we get into the video, let me clarify something. The book is wrote on the new calendar, and therefore coincides with the civil date. Myself being under roll call, I use the old calendar and will therefore be 13 days behind. This means that the 26th of October in the book corresponds to the 8th of November. This week we have a number of British saints that we commemorate. On the old calendar, this is the 8th to the 14th of November, but on the new calendar, and therefore in the book, this is the 26th of October to the 1st of November. As always, if you wish to get involved or come by and chat, you can always join the UK Orthodox Telegram group, t.me forward slash British Orthodoxy. Both myself and Nicholas are there, along with a bunch of other great guys and gals. So which saints do we commemorate this week? Apologies in advance for my poor pronunciation, but I will try my best. On Monday the 8th, we have St. Alfred the Great, St. Anurin and Gwynnock, and St. Bean, St. Sed, St. Cuthbert, St. Ata, and St. Edfred. On Tuesday the 9th, we have St. Aben, St. Coleman of Sembothfolla, and St. Otteran. On Wednesday the 10th, we have St. Dorbana and St. Edson. On Thursday the 11th, we have St. Coleman of Kilmacdo and St. Kenera. On Friday the 12th, we have St. Arilda, St. Ethelnoth, and St. Talarican. On Saturday the 13th, we have St. Bagur and St. Urk. On Sunday the 14th, we have St. Cadfan, St. Sito, St. Cledwin, St. Dingard, and St. Pabili. As there are a number of saints commemorated this week, the video would be too long to fit all into one episode. Therefore, we will release this in multiple parts. Now we have the introduction out of the way, let's actually start the readings. On Monday, we start with St. Alfred the Great in the 9th century. The holy and right-believing King Alfred the Great was King of Wessex and all Orthodox England from 871 until his repose in 899. A man of deep piety and considerable education, King St. Alfred unified Anglo-Saxon England in the face of repeated invasions by the Vikings, which he successfully brought to an end. King St. Alfred promoted education, was a great patron of the church, and a significant figure in the revival of Anglo-Saxon monasticism. King St. Alfred is also remembered as the father of English prose. He was the first king of the West Saxons to style himself King of the Anglo-Saxons and is the only English monarch with the appellation the Great. The youngest of the four sons of King Ethelworth of Wessex and his first wife, Osberger, King St. Alfred, was born in 849 in the village of Wanting, present-day Wantage, Oxfordshire. King St. Alfred suffered health problems from an early age, which, based upon the detailed description of symptoms given by a sir, vid infra, Modern physicians believe was most likely Crohn's disease. Due to his illness, King St. Alfred spent time during his youth in Ireland in pursuit of healing to no avail, and he suffered ill health throughout his life. Despite this, King St. Alfred became a great warrior who possessed an outstanding intellect. The primary source of information on King St. Alfred comes from the Vita Alfredi by a sir. A sir was a Welsh monk from St. David's community in Pembrokeshire, one of the scholars of King St. Alfred's court, and later 11th Bishop of Sherborne, 895-909. In 868, King St. Alfred married Elthworth, the daughter of Ethelred Marcel, Elderman of Gianni, most likely one of the many tribes that formed Mercia, and Edberth, a member of the Mercian royal family. Their marriage produced five or six children, including Edward the Elder, the successor of his father as king. Elfled, who became Queen of Mercia in her own right, Ethel Gifu, who became Abbess of Shaftesbury, and Elthrith, who went on to marry Count Baldwin II of Flanders. King St. Alfred assumed the throne of Wessex, as well as responsibility for its defence, on the 23rd of April, 871. Faced with continuing Viking raids, King St. Alfred was soon forced to make a somewhat uneasy peace with them. 
Five years later, in 876, under their new leader, Guthrum, the Vikings began their attacks anew. In January 878, King St. Alfred was able to mount an effective resistance from the strategic position of Ethelney on an island in the marshes of North Pentherton. Supported by militias from Somerset, Wiltshire and Hampshire, King St. Alfred initiated a well-planned offensive leading to the defeat of the Vikings at the Battle of Ethendon, which scholarly consensus identifies as present-day Eddington in Wiltshire. The Vikings were forced to retreat to their stronghold at Chippenham, roughly 25 kilometres or 15 miles to the north, where they were starved into submission. After a fortnight of hunger, the Vikings sued for peace, agreeing not only to the usual guarantees to return prisoners and quit King St. Alfred's kingdom, and that Guthrum would convert to Christianity. Three weeks later, with King St. Alfred as his sponsor, Guthrum, taking the name Athelstan, was baptised at King St. Alfred's court in Alla, along with 29 of his chieftains. Based upon a Sir's account in his Vita Alfredi, this has been generally referred to as the Peace of Wedmore and many historians believe that a subsequent document existed, known as the Treaty of Wedmore, or occasionally the Treaty of Chippenham. However, there is no evidence that a formal treaty was agreed upon at that time, and the Treaty of Wedmore is actually a modern historical creation. One of the few documents still existent from King St. Alfred's reign is called the Treaty of Alfred and Guthrum. It is not specifically linked to Wedmore, it is written in Old English and is in the collection of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, Manuscript 383. It also exists in Latin as part of the 12th century compilation of legal materials known as Quadripartis, though there is little doubt the original was written in Old English. During this time of peace, King St. Alfred was able to reoccupy London and commenced a rebuilding program, entrusting the city to the care of his son-in-law, Ethelred, Elderman of Mercia, King St. Alfred also reconstructed his military to include a standing, mobile field army, a network of garrisons, as well as expanding the naval power of Wessex, which began to patrol the rivers and estuaries of his realm on a regular basis. In addition to his military reorganisation, King St. Alfred worked to revive scholarship, which had greatly suffered during the Viking invasion. Recruiting a cadre of clerical scholars from Mercia, Wales, and the continent, King St. Alfred successfully improved the level of education at court and of the bishops. A court school was established to educate his own children and the sons of the nobility, as well as intellectually promising boys of lesser birth. Motivated by a lack of books in English, the language he believed primary instruction should be conducted in, King St. Alfred and his scholars undertook the translation into English of those books he deemed most necessary for all men to know. King St. Alfred's personal contribution to this undertaking included translation of St. Gregory, the Dialogus Pastoral Care, Boethius' Consolation of Philosophy, St. Augustine of Hippo's Soloquies, and the first 50 Psalms of the Saltier. King St. Alfred also introduced a new legal code, which, though based on existing laws, was informed by his own principles. In his introduction to this code, King St. Alfred explains his laws as a continuation of the holy past and Christian law as revealed in the Decalogue, parts of the book of Exodus and Acts, 1523-29. through 29. King St. Alfred founded monastic communities at Shaftesbury and Athelney, and apparently was planning one at Winchester. King St. Alfred's appointment of well-educated, moral, and virtuous bishops and abbots, who were true men of God, initiated a spiritual revival among the monasteries. Following Guthrum's death in 859, attacks by Vikings from the continent began anew, ending the tranquility which Wessex had known. Though, King St. Alfred's reorganised military proved to be a significant obstacle to the Viking invaders. King St. Alfred reposed on the 26th of October, 899, Whilst the cause of his death is undocumented, it is safe to assume it was as a result of the painful and unpleasant illness he suffered his entire life. King St. Alfred's body was initially buried in the Old Minster in Winchester, Hampshire, before being moved to the New Minster. In 1110, his relics were translated to Hyde Abbey, just outside the walls of Winchester, along with those of his wife and children. During the dissolution of the monasteries, 1536 to 1541, the Abbey Church was demolished, but the graves were untouched. In 1539, a prison was constructed 
by convicts over the royal graves, as well as those of many others. Unfortunately, the coffins were stripped of their lead, the bones scattered and lost, hence no verifiable relics of King St. Alfred have remained. St. Anurin and his son, Gwynoch, were Welsh monks. St. Gwynoch was the author of a number of Celtic poems, and churches at Abathas and Llanwynog, both in Poise, Wales, are dedicated to him. St. Bean was the first recorded bishop of Mortlach in Banff, Aberdeenshire, Scotland. Nothing more is known of St. Bean's life, other than that he reposed relatively soon after his consecration to the episcopate in 1012. St. Sed, 7th century. St. Sed was the brother of St. Chad of Lichfield, commemorated on the 2nd of March, and a monk at Lindisfarne. He laboured for many years enlightening the Midland English, a term St. Bede the Venerable, commemorated on the 26th of May, used to describe the inhabitants of Leicestershire and parts of Lincolnshire and Derbyshire. King Oswu of Northumbria sent St. Sed south to serve the bishop of the East Saxons at the request of their king. During his episcopate, St. Sed actively founded churches through his see as well as monasteries in Tilbury and Lastingham. It is believed St. Sed succumbed to the plague reposing on the 26th of October, 664. His feast was originally kept on the 7th of January, though in the Old English bereaveries he had a special office which was usually said on the 2nd of March. On the contemporary calendars of the Moscow Patriarchate, the Archdiocese of Theatria in Great Britain, the Ecumenical Patriarchate, and the Orthodox Church in America, St. Sed is still commemorated on the 7th of January. Little information on the early life of St. Cuthbert is still in existence. It is known that he was an Anglo-Saxon of noble birth, and that through his letters to English missionaries on the continent, that he was highly educated. St. Cuthbert succeeded St. Nothulm, commemorated on the 17th of October, as the 11th Archbishop of Canterbury in 740. St. Cuthbert is first recorded as being the Abbot of Lymage Abbey in southeast Kent, England. Most sources state that he was then elevated to the See of Hereford, circa 736. However, these are all dependent upon the works of Florence of Worcester, 1118, and other post-conquest writers. The only contemporary record is the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which states that St. Cuthbert was consecrated Archbishop of Canterbury in 740. Had he been Bishop of Hereford at that time, he was elevated to the See of Canterbury, he would have been translated, as he already possessed the Episcopal state. In addition, as Bishop of Hereford, he is credited with the composition of the epitaph for the tomb of his three predecessors at Hereford. Though it is questionable as to whether the Cathedral of the Sea was even located at Hereford at that time. Due to the significant amount of time between the events and the post-conquest chronicling, it cannot be definitively stated St. Cuthbert was Bishop of Hereford prior to his elevation to Canterbury, however likely it may be. As Archbishop, St. Cuthbert recognised the elevation of the Sea of York to Archbishopric. Pope Gregory III in 735 had sent a pallium to the Bishop of York, elevating the status of the diocese. Only consecrating bishops south of the Humber, an estuary on the east coast of northern England, and having bishops exclusively from the south of England attend his synods. In 747, St. Cuthbert, along with King Ethelbald of Mercia, presided over the Second Council of Clovesha, which, although primarily called as required by the seventh canon of the Synod of Hereford, addressed several issues confronting the church at this time. Not the least of which was the behaviour of the clergy and excessive consumption of alcohol by the bishops, which had even prompted letters of complaints from St. Boniface, commemorated on the 5th of June. Not just to St. Cuthbert and King Ethelbald, but to the Holy See as well. It had been posited that as Archbishop St. Cuthbert obtained papal permission for the previously forbidden practice of entering the dead within the walls of the city. He then mandated burial in churchyards and had the chapel of St. John the Baptist, which unfortunately was destroyed by fire in 1067, built on the west side of Canterbury Cathedral. Though generally used as a baptistery, it was designed to be the burial place for not only himself but also future archbishops. St. Cuthbert reposed on the 26th of October, 760, 
and was the first Archbishop of Canterbury to be buried in his own cathedral, not in St. Augustine's Abbey, as were many of his successors. St. Ata, 7th century. St. Ata entered Lindisfarne as a boy and became a disciple of St. Aidan. After receiving monastic tonsure, St. Ata was amongst the twelve monks selected to found a dependent monastery at Melrose in Roxburghshire, circa 651, where he served as abbot. Approximately seven years later, St. Ata left Melrose along with St. Cuthbert and others and founded a monastery at Ripon in Yorkshire. St. Ata served there as abbot until 661 when he returned to Melrose. Following the Synod of Whitby in 664, St. Ata was appointed abbot as Lindisfarne and in 678, he was consecrated bishop of Lindisfarne as well. In 684, St. Ata was transferred to Hexham, which, see, he served for the remaining two years of his life. St. Ata reposed in 686 following a bout of dysentery, and was buried in Hexham Abbey. There is one church dedicated to him in England, at Atcham in Shropshire. St. Ephred, 7th century. According to the English Menologi, St. Edfrid was a Northumbrian priest who, while visiting Mercia, converted Moel, a sub-king of the Magonicite, and preached the gospel to his subject. St. Edfrid is also believed to have founded Leominster Abbey at Hereford, Herefordshire, England. He reposed in 675. Thank you very much for joining us. Those were the saints of the British Isles that we commemorate on the 8th of November. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday will come in a separate part to this video. But for now, I would like to leave you on a quote from St. Arsenios. The Church of the British Isles will only begin to grow when she begins to venerate her own saints. 1877 God bless you all, and may the holy saints of Britain pray to God for us.